Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight for our monthly webinar. So our topic is a little bit different for tonight. We're going to be talking about something that's often brushed over whenever you're studying for a pilot license, but it's still pretty important. Um, and that's the topic of risk management, which falls under, I think it's the human factors uh, category in the ACS, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about uh, why risk management is important for us to study as pilots. Um, it can seem a little bit weird just because probably when you're studying, there's like a bunch of different acronyms that kind of make no sense. And the concepts are a little bit abstract and don't exactly connect to flying, but we'll talk about why this is important. Um, and then we're going to go through a model that we can actually use uh, for good decision making. And then we're going to apply that to a case study. We're going to analyze the JFK Jr. accident at the end of this. And then we'll kind of talk about lessons we can learn from that. All right, just as a uh, brief introduction as usual, my name is Wesley Chin. I'm a flight instructor here at the Princeton Flying School. I've been teaching here since October of 2020, so it's over two years by now, which has been awesome. Um, I'm also local to Princeton. I did all my ratings there from private through CFI and the Princeton airplanes and everything. Uh, but when I'm not flying, I'm right now in my last semester, uh, finishing up my major in finance, minoring in music at uh, Rutgers in New Brunswick. All right, so this is what we're gonna go over for today. Uh, we'll start off by talking about why risk management is important again. Um, and then we're gonna go over this model called the three Ps. Before I continue, has anybody actually heard of that? You can let me know in the chat or raise your hand. The three Ps. I don't know if Dave Machat is here. He's probably heard of that, but looks like uh, what we got. Nobody else? All right, so this will be good. It'll be kind of a new thing to talk about from the FA because, again, there's a lot of a lot of different acronyms. I remember when I was studying for um, private pilot license, I came across, let me think, we had decide, we had pave, the three Ps, the five Ps, I am safe, all these kind of weird things. Um, so hopefully by talking about this, it'll tie it all together. So we'll talk about that 3P risk management process in good detail, and then we're going to apply that to the JFK Jr. accident. So, you know, we'll just go over uh, the background of what happened first, and then we'll use the three Ps to kind of analyze what happened, um, the mistakes he made, and what we can do in the future to avoid something like that from happening again. All right, awesome. So we'll get started here. Why risk management? So this is something pretty important to study because we see often, especially in GA accidents, um, a lot of times there are like factors or causes for these accidents are just the plain inability for pilots to make good decisions. Something as simple as that, uh, whether it's maybe because they're dismissing the risk or they're just attempting to press on due to some kind of external pressures. And we're going to talk about a bunch of these later on as well. Or maybe they just don't have enough information to make a safe or smart decision, right? Uh, if you guys are interested in kind of reading more about this or learning more about accidents, which I know seems not like the uh, most exciting thing to talk about, but it's pretty important. Um, there's a good YouTube channel, AOPA. I think they make, uh, it's called Air Safety Institute. Really good videos of um, different accidents and they analyze what happened. So it's good to learn from that if you guys are interested in that. But yeah, we see often that a lot of these accidents are just because, well, we can't make good decisions. So therefore, it's pretty important that we learn how to develop a good approach to decision making so that no matter what circumstances we're facing, we can make a good decision. And we call that aeronautical decision making or ADM, just a fancy term that the FAA uses for well, making a good decision in an airplane. We love flying, uh, it's super fun, but just like some other activities we enjoy, uh, flying has risk. Uh, we can't always eliminate all risk when flying, uh, otherwise then we just don't fly, right? But we, we can always try our best to identify hazards. Uh, hazards are anything that can contribute to some undesired event, and then we can mitigate those associated risks. So to do all of this, uh, we can perform good ADM, by using what we call the three P risk management process, the three P's. Um, again, there's a lot of different acronyms that are going to fall under this, but we're going to just say the three P's. Um, those three steps we have number one, perceive hazards. So that's the first thing. And after that, we're going to process to evaluate the level of risk associated with those hazards. And finally, we're going to perform risk management. So those are three P's. Uh, it seems pretty self explanatory and basic and 
for a good amount of people, it may just be common sense, uh, but it can definitely be tough to do these things when you're flying an airplane and you're tasked with some additional uh, workload on top of that. So we're just going to briefly check out an example of how these three P's work before we start delving into more detail about this. So uh, first thing here at perceiving hazards, let me just move the zoom thing out of the way. Um, let's say maybe, you know, you're doing your pre-flight planning and you're looking at your weather briefing right now. And you see that there is a convective sig sigmet that's popped up along your route. And we know that's not really too good. So, OK, we've perceived some hazard. Uh, the next thing would be to process to evaluate the level of risk. So we, what do we know about convective sigmets? OK, something about thunderstorms, right? And we know that flying into or around a thunderstorm is not good. It can be catastrophic and we do not want to mess around with that. So now we're going to think about, hmm, what can we do? What are some risk control measures? So maybe we want to change our departure time, whether that's trying to beat the storm or waiting until it passes. Uh, we could maybe even try to circumnavigate the cell in the air or just cancel the flight altogether and drive instead or maybe wait another day if it's not that important. So now we've got these different alternatives or options, right? And the last step would be to perform risk management. So now we're gonna decide what to do. So here, let's just say, for example, we decide to take off earlier to try to beat the storm uh, coming in, right? So now here's the important part about this aeronautical decision-making process. It's gonna be continuous. We never just do it once and forget about it. Um, so we always wanna to continue to evaluate the outcome of our decision, right? In other words, we have to determine if what we chose is actually working, right? Maybe in this situation, there's more thunderstorm cells popping up, which is not good, or they're going away, which is great. So you kind of always have to keep thinking ahead of the game and just always staying on top of this saying, all right, I'm, I have a new set of circumstances. What do I need to do in this case? All right, so that was just a brief look at this, but what we're going to do now is uh, really take a look at each one of these steps in detail. There's more acronyms involved under each of these three P's, which can kind of be painful. Um, we'll talk about all the, and then hopefully this will kind of connect all of those things that you've been studying together. Um, but after the presentation is over, I'll also send you guys uh, a link in the chat to a document that I put together that kind of has all the acronyms together. Um, and then when this is uploaded to YouTube, we'll also have that in the description so you guys can have a good understanding of what these three P's are. We'll get started here. All right, 3P risk management process. So we know the first step uh, is to perceive hazards, perceive hazards. So pretty straightforward. The goal of this step is to identify any hazards, right? It means hazards create risk. Um, and we start this step during your pre-flight planning process. But just like we said before, this should continue throughout the flight. That's going to be a message we're just going to constantly uh, reiterate throughout this presentation, that this aeronautical decision making is a continuous loop process. Um, so the acronym for perceiving hazards, well, there's four different categories we can look for hazards in. You may have heard of this acronym before. Uh, if you guys are private pilots, hopefully you've heard of this before. And their acronym to perceive hazards is PAVE. So that's P-A-V-E. So before I go and explain them all, do you guys know what that may be? I don't know if you guys can unmute or say it in the chat, but... Anyone know the first uh, letter, the P? What does that stand for in PAVE? Pilot. Pilot, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's our first category. Um, next, we have an A. What would that be? Anybody? Air aircraft. Aircraft, you got to be on. All right. We've got two more here. Uh, the V, well, the word actually doesn't start with the V, but it's in it because... Well, I, I know it, but I'm not... Uh, I'm not taking uh, the opportunity for everybody else right. that you wanted. <laughs> Let's see. Anybody else uh, want to give it a shot first before bad guys? Let's see. Environment. That's exactly right. All right. And we have one more. This is uh, also going to start with an E. It's probably the most important one as well. All right. Anybody want to give it a shot? External pressures. External pressures. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's our PAVE acronym. Um, so essentially, we would be looking at these four different categories to see if there's any hazards that could create risk during our flight. All right. So let's go to the next slide here. We're going to break down each of these into more detail. I know it seems like there's going to be a lot of categories and subcategories and whatnot. Um, but again, hopefully this is just going to tie all this stuff together for you into one easy to remember model. All right. So yeah, PAVE. 
Um, we know that the first part of that is pilot. So some of the things that we'd want to consider in terms of hazards for pilot. Uh, the first thing would be currency. Does anybody know what currency means or what we're kind of getting at with currency? If not, I'll talk about it. All right, nobody. So anyways, um, it's, uh, oh, AG, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was thinking that does it have something to do with the uh, takeoffs and landings in the 90 days for day and night? Um, yeah, yeah, that can definitely uh, play a part of this, right? So this is just essentially saying, are you legal to go flying? Um, pretty basic, right? And the main requirement that you need to act as PIC is our flight review, which is needed every 24 calendar months. And AG just brought up what we need to carry passengers, right? Um, so for daytime, you would need to do three takeoff and landings in the preceding 90 days. It's got to be in the same category in class. Uh, nighttime would be the same thing, but it has to be to a full stop. So yeah, that's what the currency has to deal with. So it's pretty straightforward, just making sure that you meet those minimum legal requirements and are able to go fly. Uh, the next thing to consider kind of related to this as well would be recency of experience. So I guess we'll kind of keep doing this. Does anybody want to briefly mention what they know about recency of experience? And if not, I'll uh, be happy to talk about it. Wesley, uh, I have a quick question about the currency. Of course, yeah. So uh, let's say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting out and uh, I, in the last three months, I've got my currency for the day flying, right? But then I've mm -hmm. been continuously flying my friends or somebody else. Does it still require to maintain the currency of individual flying and then maintaining this or, or the, uh, uh, you know, traveling with uh, my friends would still work towards the currency? Yeah, it's a good question. So this is essentially rolling every 90 days, or I, I should say in the preceding 90 days of the date you want to carry your passengers in, you've got to have logged those certain amount of takeoff and landings, whether it's a day or nighttime. Okay. Awesome. I can do this with passengers. So if I did a landing within, within the last 90 days with a passenger, it, it still counts onto that. Right, right. As long as you're doing those three takeoff and landings in the last 90 days, and you're right, you definitely okay. could be passengers on board, that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. right, good questions, good questions. All right. Um, but in terms of recency of experience, essentially, this is kind of related to currency and the next thing we're going to talk about as well. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it's just asking, well, when's the last time you were flying in these kind of certain conditions? Uh, maybe you're going to fly IFR. Well, when was the last time you went IFR? Because that's definitely a different skill set you want to exercise relatively often, and it can be easy to lose, right? Um, the next thing in the pilot category connected to this would be proficiency. Uh, there's a big difference between currency and proficiency. Um, hopefully, if anyone's preparing for their check ride or already private pilots or so on, you guys know what this is about. But does anyone want to give a shot? What is uh, proficiency dealing with? I waited long enough. I think currency <laughs> is I'm uh, I'm legally allowed to do it. Proficiency is I actually can do it. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right about that. It's the difference between yeah, you meet the bare minimum legal requirements to fly and do whatever, but proficiency is you actually know what you're doing. You know, you, you know the systems and equipment of your airplane and your own personal limitations, and you can make safe decisions in the air. So yeah, that's what proficiency is about. I can tell Bayat's been studying. Then we have a uh, mock check ride together next week. So it looks like he's already in pretty good shape. All right. Um, next so. up. Yeah, yeah. It looked pretty good so far. I think uh, Steve Michelle is still in here. He was, but yeah, looking pretty good. Okay. Um, the last thing we'll talk about under the pilot category to determine any hazards, probably the most important thing under here, is uh, what we call a self assessment. Because every time before you go flying, you want to be assessing yourself. For six basic things, not, nothing crazy, you don't have to write anything down, but just things to think about before you go flying, right? We have a little acronym for this here, for the self-assessment. Anybody know what this acronym is? Uh, yes, that would be uh, I am safe. I am safe. Yeah, I think a couple people want to jump at that, but that's, uh, that's exactly right. I am safe. Well, I could just uh, press a button and uh, put all of them out, but anyone want to give it a shot and tell us what the different categories of I am safe are? Uh, I, I think, is illness. Mm -hmm. uh, and then M is medication. S is stress. 
Um, F is, I think, fatigue, and E is, um, let me just see, uh, external pressures, I believe, or um, and external is, pressures will come in, uh, come in something else. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. F is fatigue. Anybody know what the uh, the A and the E would be? There's two E's, I guess, you could talk about, but what else is the A stand for ability? That's a good guess. Ability would be a good guess. Oh, alcohol. Alcohol. Here we go. So we've got alcohol. Yeah. All right. Uh, fatigue and then the E. What's this? Uh, I think last that's e? eat. Eating. Yeah, there you go. Eating. Exactly right. There's actually one more that uh, we can talk about as well besides eating. What's the what, emotion. Anyone, emotion? Emotion. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know what the one that's published in the book is, but I've seen both. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's I am safe. So here we have these different things to look at in terms of you, the pilot, to identify any hazards in beforehand, right? So in terms of what hazards could we actually perceive from this? Okay, pretty basic, right? Maybe we're not current to fly. We don't. We weren't flying recently. Uh, we don't feel proficient in the aircraft or the kind of conditions we plan on flying in, or any one of these I am safe categories, right? We're sick. You're taking some kind of medication that has. Um, a side effect. You're feeling stressed out. You were drinking, all right? Um, we know the alcohol, the two rule is usually associated with that, all right? Uh, no more than 0.04% of blood alcohol content and then eight hours bottle to throttle, right? But hopefully we have higher or I say more conservative limit, uh, limitations than that. Um, fatigue, right? Maybe we just didn't sleep enough the night before. We're, we're not eating enough or we're not feeling well, whatever it is. Um, these are where we can perceive hazards in the pilot. All right, awesome. So next part of PAVE is A. Okay. So one of the most important things uh, in terms of procedure hazards in the aircraft, uh, familiarity with the systems and equipment, right? You, you want to know how to operate what's going on in the plane. Um, you know, a lot of us were doing training in a 172 and that's <laughs> almost as basic as it gets, right? Um, but moment, maybe we step up to uh, the DA-40, which is back now at the airport. Definitely, definitely want to do that, right? Uh, there's some new things to learn, right? And it can take time to become familiar with that stuff, right? The G-1000 system. Um, what else we have in that? Constant speed propeller, right? Or maybe you're going to fly an airplane uh, that's high performance or retractable landing gear. Whatever it is, you want to be familiar with the aircraft systems and equipment, right? And on top of that, well, whatever the equipment is on board, is it appropriate for the flight? And on top of that, of course, is it actually working? Uh, I'm not going to list out the full acronyms and everything. Uh, it is on the sheet that I'll send out later, but the minimum or uh, equipment that we need for VFR daytime, right? That's the A tomato flames acronym. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with that. Uh, for VFR nighttime, it's that acronym plus uh, flaps. Not flaps on an airplane, but the acronym itself is flaps, five different things. And if you're going IFR, we need, uh, in addition to whatever we needed for VFR, something called a grab card, so eight additional things. If you guys are uh, work on an instrument, maybe you guys know about that. All right, um, let's see what we have next. Runway lengths, right? Your aircraft needs to be able to use the planned runway lengths at your uh, departure and destination airport, of course. Weight and balance is also going to play, uh, play a part here, right? Um, so doing the calculations and computations beforehand and making sure that when you actually arrive at the airplane, that what you expected or computed is what you have, right? Making sure that, all right, I have just the amount of fuel I plan for because maybe too much would put me uh, overweight, for example, right? That connects with fuel we just talked about. And the last thing I have under aircraft would be uh, inspections that are complied with, right? We want to make sure, of course, that whatever you're flying is airworthy so that um, we're going to talk about aviated for the acronym, but this would also include aero for the required documents on board the airplane and doing a pre-flight inspection, right? That's your responsibility as PIC to determine that the aircraft is safe and good to go before flying, right? Uh, but the acronym, I know we've definitely gone over this uh, in past webinars, just like with all this stuff, uh, is aviated. Aviated are the required inspections, right? So, uh, yeah, let's see if uh, you guys can kind of shout out what you know about this. So, uh, what would be the first A in terms of the required inspections? Anyone want to give that a shot? Altimeter. Altimeter. Yeah, that's the 
Yeah, there you go. So the altimeter and pedostatic system, that is one of the uh, required inspections. I'm not going to press it on the screen yet because I actually have a different A as the first one, but you're totally right about that, John. Yeah, altimeter and pedostatic has to be inspected uh, every 24 calendar months, but it's actually IFR only. Um, so yeah, so what else do we have here under aviated? Anyone else want to shout it out? Uh, v is VOR. V is VOR. Yeah, that's the other one that's needed for uh, IFR only. Angie, I know you're studying for uh, your instrument check ride coming up, right? How often do we have to uh, make a note or check the VOR equipment in the airplane? Uh, VOR has to be inspected every 30 days. <laughs> every 30 days. That's right there. Awesome. All right. So we got the V. We got one of the A's. Anybody else want to give it a shot before I give them the rest? Well, the one is the 100 um, hours inspection. There you I go. Think, yeah. The E is, I think, the ELT inspection. Mm -hmm. And then I gave one. Transponder. <laughs> Transponder. There you go. I heard, I heard a couple of them. Yeah, you got to be out in John. So we had the uh, 100 hour inspection, right, for any aircraft used for higher flight instruction. Um, we have the ELT that has to be inspected every 12 calendar months. And John, you said the transponder. That's exactly right, right? If we need a transponder, we have to also inspect that every uh, 24 calendar months. So we got. Uh, Let's give them here. We got one more A in the D, which is sometimes including the acronym. Um, the other A, probably the most common important one, is the annual inspection, right? I think you guys can figure out how often we have to do that, but that's every 12 calendar months, and all aircraft need an annual inspection, right? Uh, and then finally, we have uh, the D, which is airworthiness directives, right? That's just saying we have to comply with any that are, are required for the aircraft, right? So there it is. Uh, that's aviated. You'll find this in a bunch of other webinars and uh, all your different studying. But again, the presentation and this other document with all this stuff listed on it will be provided uh, later. So this is where we perceive hazards for the aircraft, right? So some hazards could be, if I'm just going down the list, not being familiar with uh, the equipment and systems on board the airplane, or okay, maybe- Quick question, what is VOR? <laughs> Can you abbreviate that? What is VOR? Yeah, so that's a very high frequency, Omnidirectional range. Okay. It's okay if you haven't learned about it yet. It's some kind of a ground based navigational equipment. Uh, it's somewhat outdated, but pretty important to know how to use for now still. Um, you, you will learn about it during your private pilot training, but it's, it's definitely something you're going to get into more detail if you decide to pursue your uh, instrument rating, for example. But yeah, that's the VOR. It's a, it's a pretty big term. So that's why we just call it VOR. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, um, hazards we're talking about. So, again, not being familiar with the uh, you know equipment or systems, or maybe the equipment uh, is not appropriate for the flight. You, maybe you need an additional radio or GPS, or maybe something is not working, all right? Um, continuing down the list, your airplane would not be able to use the runway lengths. You're overweight, or you're, maybe your center of gravity is not within the envelope. Uh, too much, too little fuel, or one of the inspections is not complied with, you're not airworthy, right? Any one of those could be the hazards under aircraft. All right, moving along. So we have uh, the third one, which is environment. All right, so a couple of different things to talk about in environment that are pretty important. Uh, you guys have probably guessed the first one based on what you see in that little picture on the left side of the uh, Aviation Weather Center. Oh, there's weather. <laughs> okay. So essentially, this just consists of making sure that you're conducting a good weather briefing before you go flying. So you can identify any hazards or something that could pop up, right? Um, there's a lot of ways to do this nowadays. Yes, you can definitely still call 1-800-WX-BRIEF, but um, they're more advocating for a switch towards self-briefings or essentially you doing this yourself with uh, Aviation Weather Center or 1-800-WXBrief.com or even for flight, that's totally okay as well if you if you want to use that. You know, all these are okay sources because everything comes from this Aviation Weather Center. And right? just a brief sidebar from here, um, the screenshot that I have on the left of the Aviation Weather Center is of the uh, graphical area forecast tool, the GFA. I won't spend too much time uh, discussing it but if you guys don't know about that tool i highly suggest you check it out 
because it basically combines all of the forecasts into one nice display where you can drag a time around to kind of see what the weather will be like. Um, it has everything. It's got your TAFs, ceilings and visibilities, um, cloud forecasts, which somehow, you know, not too many people know about, but which is pretty helpful, right? Uh, it's got precipitation, thunderstorms, wind shear, all, all that good stuff is uh, in that GFA tool. It combines everything. So that's uh, definitely something you can use during your weather briefing. So essentially, again, make sure you conduct a good briefing beforehand uh, and update it right before you go flying as well, right? Uh, just another example, maybe you have a cross-country flight at 1 p.m. tomorrow and you're going to do your briefing uh, the night before, which is good. But remember to update that right beforehand as well because some new things may pop up that you didn't see before. All right, uh, next up in environment would be airports, right? Um, so, for example, maybe you're operating at a towered airport or a non-towered, and maybe you're not as familiar with one of them, and that's okay. You just want to understand that each one of these presents different challenges uh, that you want to be familiar with. Um, NOTAMs, right? Notices to air missions is the term I think nowadays. Um, is there anything closed? Is the airport closed or is a runway closed, taxiway, whatever it is, right? You want to be checking that, and that should come a part of your uh, weather briefing beforehand. And maybe it's a tower airport and you're looking at the airport diagram and it looks kind of complex with the taxiway and runway layout. Additionally, you would be looking for any hot spots. Anybody know what a hot spot is? I'll, I'll talk about it afterwards, but I'm curious if anybody knows what that is. Hot spots, airport hot spots. An area where frequent issues occur. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, people keep messing up, right? Um, it's, right, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, some kind of complex intersection or whatever it is on the airport surface that they constantly see people keep turning in the wrong direction or keep getting themselves into trouble or maybe it's hard for them to see or the markings are confusing. Whatever it is, it's just something. Uh, so, yeah, if you see that, you want to definitely pay extra attention to that because that's that's a big hazard to think about, right? Um, continuing on, we have airspace. So a couple of things to think about in here. Um, at the most simple level, maybe controlled versus uh, uncontrolled, right? So we know that each one would provide different operating limitations and things to think about. Uh, special use as well on top of that, right? You see you're going to be flying through an alert area or a restricted area or whatever it is you want to be uh, aware of of the kind of hazards that you could find in those special use airspaces, how to determine if it's active, who to contact, all that good stuff, right? TFRs, temporary flight restrictions. We don't want to mess up, you know, mess up with any of that. We don't want to <laughs> accidentally get into that, especially a presidential TFR. So again, all this should come uh, when you're doing your weather briefing. And then a very important one uh, that we're going to talk about, especially later on for our case study, is flying over water or remote areas, because we know that can present some additional challenges, especially with dealing with emergency landing sites, right? And when you're flying over water, your options are a lot more limited. And that kind of connects to the next thing, which is terrain, right? Are there any obstacles or high terrain to look for? Um, a good tool for this is what we call MEFs, Maximum Elevation Figures. I'll ask again, does anybody know what those are? Maximum elevation figures? Three, two, one. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. All right. <laughs> uh, in a sectional, you see it in, a, in one square, you see a number uh, which actually states what is the highest elevation there mm -hmm. in that particular area. That's exactly right. So I'm going to put this tab over here. Do you guys all see a sky vector? Hopefully. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, we uh, zoom in, you'll get, you're going to see these quadrants um, that are marked and these big blue numbers. So yeah, right here in this one, for example, there's like a one and a small seven. So 1700 feet there would exactly there would be your maximum elevation figure. So if you stay above that, you should be good and you won't end up hitting anything in that quadrant. All right. Very good. So that's terrain. And then the last thing under environment would be day versus night because night flying it presents a lot of additional challenges that we don't often see in daytime. It can seem kind of basic to think about, but your first night flight may seem kind of surprising on how difficult it is to maintain altitude or land the airplane or whatever it is. A lot of the judgment uh, gets skewed a little bit. 
So what we're essentially talking about are uh, visual illusions at nighttime, right? Um, autokinesis, for example, maybe you're staring at a light for too long and it feels like it's starting to move or your approach doesn't seem right, all that kind of stuff. Um, lighting systems, right? Understanding what the lights are on your airplane and how they work and also at the airport. When you go into an airport at light, there's a lot of lights and it can seem kind of confusing because now you don't really see the surface and you don't want to end up on the grass, right? So you want to know that, oh, okay, yes, that blue light is the edge of the taxiway, for example. And the last thing would be emergency landings, right? At nighttime, well, you can't really see if uh, there's either a big field or trees below you. So that's another uh, potential hazard. So environment, there's definitely a lot of things that you want to be uh, paying attention to beforehand. The last part of PAVE, uh, probably the most important uh, part of this would be external pressures. We'll talk about why this is the most important afterwards. Um, but a couple examples of this, uh, one of the most prominent is get their itis. This is a form of planned continuation bias, but um, maybe for example, you're flying to your job and you're going to be late for a meeting. You want to keep going, right? No matter what the conditions are. Or it's been a long day. You want to get back home so you can go to sleep. You got to work the next day, right? Um, another external pressure could be maybe you have a desire to impress somebody, whether that's somebody is on the ground or a passenger, right? And this connects to the last one here, um, not wanting to disappoint your passengers. So the reason why these external pressures are so important is because this is the one risk factor category that can cause you to ignore everything else we just talked about which seems kind of crazy because we, we talked about some some details you know important stuff like yeah weather is super important yeah you want to do your pre-flight you want to make sure i am safe all definitely all of that is important but it's these external pressures any one of these that'll cause you to just dismiss all that other stuff and not make good decisions so you always want to remember that with these external pressures and pressures and kind of think about that whenever you're uh, going through this 3p process right this is the one thing that can Kind of skew your decision making. All right, great. So that's the first step. I know it seems long, but that was the longest one. And the next are going to go relatively uh, quicker. So the second part of the three P's is a uh, process. We process to evaluate the level of risk. So essentially, again, basic stuff here. We're assessing the risk in terms of its probability and severity that could result from being exposed to that hazard. And then we're going to just kind of think about some options or strategies and tools to either reduce, mitigate, or eliminate the risk. So the acronym we're going to use for uh, this part, I know there's a lot, is going to be CARE, C-A-R-E. I never heard of this at all when I was studying for my private pilot certificate. I only figured this out when I was doing my CFI training. Um, but if you guys know what this is, that's, that's, that's awesome. I'm curious, does anybody actually know what the CARE acronym is without looking it up? <laughs> it's okay if you don't, I'm just, just curious. All right, okay. That's all good. Pretty much what I was expecting. Um, but yeah, this is um, what we're going to do to process the evaluate, uh, process to evaluate the level of risk. Excuse me. So four different things in the CARE acronym. We have to think about consequences, alternatives, the reality, and then yes, again, external pressures. Right. So the way the FAA has us remember this in the book and in their little handout for this is. Why do we care about these hazards? That yeah, works. I didn't make that up, but it works. Okay. So there's not too, too much to kind of go over in this detail since most of it is pretty straightforward. Um, but the first thing, you know, what are the consequences of being exposed uh, to those hazards, right? Uh, the second thing would be, what are the alternatives available to us, right? This is where we're thinking about, okay, there's a lot of different things we could do in this situation, right? Uh, we have to think about what is the reality of this situation that you're facing. And finally, any external pressures that could, again, affect our thinking, right? That's, I know it shows up again, but it's just because it's that important when you're thinking about external pressures, because that's the one thing that can cause you to forget everything else. So yeah, there's nothing too, too much to uh, explain in detail as it is relatively self-explanatory, but that's care. And we use that to uh, evaluate the level of risk that we uh, find in those hazards we just perceived. Um, but kind of the takeaway from this part is if you find yourself saying that it'll probably be okay, 
is tiny sit down and try to take a good look at what's going on here. It probably is not good. We don't want to have probably when making decisions, right? We want to make good decisions. Probably is not not something that may lead to a good decision, right? Um, so again, you want to really, really use these four things, kind of think about the level of risk that you're finding in those hazards. And then the uh, last part of, of the three Ps would be uh, perform risk management. Great. So we just talked about uh, A, which is alternatives, right? We just kind of looked at, all right, different strategies and tools. So now we're going to choose the best strategy and take the action to try to eliminate those hazards or mitigate the risk. Now, again, the important part of this, remember to continuously evaluate the outcome of your action to ensure its effectiveness. This is a continuous process, right? You're always going to be faced with a new set of circumstances and you want to keep doing these three Ps over and over again. All right. We got one more acronym. I know this is uh, kind of tough, but uh, the acronym for this is TEAM, T-E-A-M. Again, I never heard of this until I was studying for CFI training and learning about all this in more detail. Um, anybody know what this stands for? All right, that's what I expected. Anyways, so essentially TEAM tells us we have four options to perform risk management. I know, again, this stuff may seem kind of silly, but we'll talk about ways to put this um, into use practically afterwards. But all right, uh, the first thing we could do is transfer the risk. Uh, we could eliminate the risk, could accept the risk, or finally, there we go, mitigate the risk. So that's team, T-E-A-M. And again, there's not too, too much to uh, explain with these, but in terms of the T for transferring the risk, this is just, in other words, asking, does somebody else need to make a decision or perform an action, whether that's like a, a more experienced pilot or a chief pilot or instructor, whatever that is, right? The second option to eliminate the risk, well, uh, we briefly mentioned this in the first opening slides, but well, the only way you can really completely eliminate the uh, hazard and therefore the risk would be not flying in this case, right? Uh, a would be accept the risk, right? And we only want to be accepting the risk if we feel that the benefits of accepting the risk can outweigh the cost. And definitely in some situations it can. And then finally, mitigate the risk, right? In other words, this is probably the most common thing people will do. We try to uh, reduce the risk level, right? So usually we can't take away all of it. We'll try to reduce it. So that's team. That's the last step of the three Ps in terms of uh, performing risk management. And again, I just have uh, one more slide on this. I know I've said this a bunch of times, but we just have to remember that ADM is a continuous process, right? You want to keep doing this and it'll become automatic, just like how you know you're scanning your outside instruments back and forth. Just kind of keep your brain thinking ahead of whatever circumstances you're currently facing and may face and think about uh, this 3P process to help you make decisions. And again, I, it, this stuff can seem a little bit silly because it's may not directly connect to how to fly an airplane, but definitely one day this can save your life. You know, um, you'll see these accident reports and analyses and you're like, oh my God, what are these, what are these guys thinking in terms of their decision making, right? So what we're going to do now, uh, we've learned about the three Ps. We're going to try applying this to a real world case study. And that's going to be the JFK Jr. accident. Um, I don't have any videos and I'm not going to open up like a flight simulator to try to recreate any of that, but we'll just talk about the uh, background of what happened. And then we're going to apply what we just learned about the three P's to this situation to kind of figure out um, how we could have made a better decision and what we can do in the future to prevent something like this from happening again. All right. So the JFK Jr. accident on the left here, that's a picture of um, the actual plane there, 9253 November. So Piper Saratoga. Um, okay, so this quote here from AOPA. On July 16th, 1999, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. took off from Essex County Airport in Caldwell, New Jersey. That's close to us, right? CDW, that's uh, Class D Airport up north. At 8.39 p.m., that's nighttime. At 9.41 p.m., he crashed his Piper Saratoga into the Atlantic Ocean, seven and a half miles short of his goal of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, killing himself, his wife, Carolyn, and his sister-in-law, Lauren Bissett. Okay. So this, uh, this slide, you don't have to memorize or anything, any of this stuff, just kind of talking about what happened in the last uh a uh, couple of seconds leading up to the accident. So it was pretty uneventful until the airplane uh, began descending. So 
just kind of reading this off here, um, the airplane began descending uh, from 5,500 feet, about 34 miles west of Martha's Vineyard at a rate of 400 to 800 feet per minute. So a pretty standard descent rate kind of early, but just no, nothing crazy about that. About seven miles away from the, aer uh, in the airport, the airplane actually began to turn right in a southerly direction. So now he's drifting off course. 30 seconds after that, the airplane actually stopped descending at 2,200 feet. And now he started a climb and this lasted another 30 seconds. He then leveled off at 2,500 feet and then started another climb, but now he's in a left turn. And now 50 seconds later, he ends up at 2,600 feet. So a pretty shallow climb, but he's turning as well. However, as he's continuing in this turn, as after leveling off, now he begins descending at 900 feet per minute and rolls out of the turn at an easterly heading. You guys can kind of see what's going on here. Uh, but while he was still in descent, he started a right turn. But however, now this time the turn rate increased, causing the descent rate and therefore the airspeed, airspeed to also increase. And they found eventually that the descent rate exceeded 4,700 feet per minute. That's a lot. On our vertical speed indicators, we just see it goes to 2,000 and nothing more. So more than double that, which is not good, I'd say. Um, so it's pretty clear if just by reading this that uh, he got himself disoriented. Um, but this is what the NTSB had to say. So they say the, the National Transportation Safety Board determines the probable causes of this accident as follows. The pilot's failure to maintain control of the airplane during a descent over water at night, which is a result of spatial disorientation, which we clearly just saw from the last you know, chain of events there. Uh, uh, that's, uh, just a quick uh, question. Yeah, of course. I, I, I've read this uh, case incident uh, before, uh, just as an inquisitive thing, right? But mm -hmm. uh, the more important thing about that was uh, it was an IFR condition. He was not uh, he was not an IFR uh, pilot, certified pilot, right? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. We're gonna get into actually just in the next slides, but you're totally oh, correct okay, about okay. that. Sorry, sorry, um, about that. Oh, no, you're, you're, no, no problem at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you have some background on this, and and uh, probably some of you guys have that too. But you're totally correct. That's one of the factors that we're gonna talk about. There's there's so many factors as a matter of fact, but uh, at least what the NTSB said after the spatial disorientation, other factors in this accident were haze, which I think you're you're uh, getting at that as well, and then the dark night. <laughs> so. We're going to take a look at the background of this now, and there's three slides of a lot of um, information that you guys are probably going to be surprised to hear about. Uh, but okay, that's uh, that's what happened. So now we'll take a look at the accident background. Okay, so the first thing, uh, this wasn't just like a joyride. Uh, this flight had a purpose, and the purpose of the flight was to drop off his sister-in-law at Martha's Vineyard. And then he was asked to go fly to another airport to attend his cousin's wedding at the Kennedy compound, okay? In terms of his route, and I'll show you guys a screenshot on Sky Vector of what this looked like afterwards. You know, he was hugging the uh, coastline button, actually decided to fly directly to Martha's Vineyard from Point Judith in Rhode Island. And what essentially that does is put him over a 30 mile, about 30 mile open stretch of water. So he doesn't have land to run, just 30 miles of open water, uh, rather than maybe hugging the coast. Just as Sriram mentioned before, um, JFK Jr. was a private pilot, but he did not have his instrument rating. He was training for the instrument rating. Uh, CFI said he was not able to take the check right yet because his IFR skills were not proficient enough. Um, but what he did do, he did pass his written with a 78 four months prior to the accident. So, all right, he's getting somewhere. But again, uh, instructors felt he was not totally proficient yet to uh, be able to fly IFR. So again, here's that screenshot of what the route looks like. I don't have the full thing, but this is just hugging the, uh, the coast. But here's Point Judith. And here's Martha's Vineyard. And according to this, that's 39 miles. Um, that's a lot of open water to be at on at nighttime. I don't know about you. I, I don't even, I probably wouldn't want to do that at daytime either, but I don't have anything on board. But uh, that's what he chose to do. All right, continuing along. 
So he was fairly familiar with this route, actually. Um, and again, I'm taking all this stuff from the NTSB report, which is available online if you guys are interested in reading it. But um, he said he actually flew this route from northern New Jersey, not the exact airport, but from that area to the Martha's Vineyard area 35 times in the last 15 months. So that's a little bit over two times a month, which is pretty, pretty you know, frequent. He's flying in a good amount with more than 17 of those flights without a CFI on board. So in other words, he's doing them solo. And at least five of them were at nighttime. So, okay, somewhat diverse in terms of his experience doing this exact route. Now, the plane, the Piper Saratoga, was purchased only three months before this accident, right? So relatively new to him. In terms of his hours, this is an estimate as uh, in terms of logging. Maybe you guys know that after you get your private class certificate or essentially you don't have to log anything that's not required for like a training purpose. So if you're just flying for fun, technically you don't have to log it. And sometimes people forget. So this is an estimate here, but uh, the estimate he had uh, about 36 hours in that exact airplane, 36 hours. And of those 36 hours, 9.4 of it was at nighttime. Okay. There's some, not, not a lot. Now we continue further. Of the 36 hours in this exact airplane, only three were solo. So the other 33 he had an instructor on board, but he only has three hours of solo time in that airplane. Even further. Of those three hours of solo time, only 0 0.8. 0 0.8 of that was at nighttime. That's shorter than one lesson. Only 0.8 of his solo time was at night in this airplane, and he only had done one solo night landing in it. All right. Okay, so we talked about, yes, he uh, got the plane three months before, but he received the endorsement, the complex endorsement, to fly this airplane professionally two months prior to the accident. So relatively new at these systems of the airplane. All right, continuing along. Uh, weather and Sriyan brought this up before, right? The weather was not the best that night. Um, it was pretty hazy along the route of flight. Several of the airports along the route reported five to eight miles visibility with haze. Even in daytime, that's not great. But at nighttime, especially over open water, and we're going to talk about that soon. That's that's definitely not good. Um, the NTSB report even they even interviewed some pilots flying that night and these guys said they reported no visual horizon over water due to the haze which means they were flying over the water and they couldn't see the horizon effectively making an IFR yeah but if you're looking at this in terms of the, the plane weather this is still technically via far away we have those um that above the three miles of visibility so technically yes that's via far continuing on um, so we talked about how this flight had a purpose, but he also had a, a planned departure time of 6 p.m. However, he actually didn't depart until 8.39 p.m., if you guys remember. And that was a half an hour past sunset, so it's dark. The reason was his sister-in-law was stuck at work and then also in traffic. So the departure was late. I'll put that out there. We also just mentioned that the weather was not great, um, but there was no record of a weather briefing uh, being done or a flight plan being filed. Um, he did check some METARs, uh, what the report says. He did look at some quick weather reports um, of some airports around the area several hours before the flight, but didn't update with any additional information right before him. Um, he didn't speak to anybody else about the weather at the airport. And he may have even found it if he did that the flight school at the airport even canceled all their lessons that night due to the weather. Here's another thing. A CFI offered to fly with him prior to departure. That's right. He was loading up his plane. CFI comes up to him. His CFI comes up to him and says, hey, it's a little weird up there. I'll, I'll fly with you. But JFK Jr. declines this offer. And this is from the report. He says he wanted to do it alone. Wanted to do it alone. All right. There's, there's more. <laughs> so before all this, he fractured his left ankle. Uh, let's see. Am I have a question? Uh, there you go. Uh, the, the external pressures. Yes. 
Exactly right. That's exactly right. One of the big ones right there. Um, this accident exemplifies <laughs> almost everything we just talked about before. Uh, but you're right. Yeah, it's one of those external pressures. And here's um, one of our I'm safe elements coming up now. So yeah, he fractured his left ankle in what they call a hang gliding accident six weeks before the accident. So that's a month and a half. It was that bad that he had to get surgery and he wore a cast. This cast was removed the day before the accident, and he still walked with a limp. Now, he's even that bad that a CFI actually had to assist him to land the airplane at Martha's Vineyard three weeks before the accident because he couldn't apply enough pressure on the pedals to keep the nose straight. And same thing during taxiing. He needed help taxiing the airplane just weeks before the accident due to this, um, this uh, accident here. Continuing on. He was going uh, undergoing marital and financial troubles. I think I was reading his uh, his magazine wasn't doing too well. He was fighting with his wife. Not good. He also didn't sleep too much the night before. The report states he uh, went out to a Yankees game and after drinks the night before, didn't sleep too much. But again, this was a full night before him. But uh, okay, that's the end of the background. You guys hopefully find a lot of that alarming to read. Um, but what we're going to do is take all that and apply it into the three P's. Um, my hope is that for everybody reading this, that it's, if you're faced with these kind of uh, things, that it's common sense to not go fly an airplane. Um, but let's use the three P's now and kind of determine what happened. Okay. So the first thing, as we know, is to perceive hazards, right? And we use the uh, PAVE acronym for that, and that's a uh, pilot. So a lot of stuff. So let's start off with the currency. All right. Well, we, as long as we know, he, he was legally current and able to take the flight. He was a private pilot certificated, but not instrument rated. So recency of experience we talked about, right? Um, not great. Not great in this department, right? He only had three hours of solo time in that airplane. And only 0.8 of it was at night, only one night landing. He was endorsed for complex airplanes two months ago, so relatively new. But he did fly this trip and route relatively often, right? It was 35 times in the last 15 months. Uh, proficiency, again, this connects to that. Uh, this is another department where he's not looking too good. Um, Definitely lacking in those solo and night hours and landings. You know, it's pretty low, especially in that kind of airplane. Uh, and he was new at those complex systems. The airplane that he previously flew was a Cessna 182, which is not as complex as a uh, Saratoga. Uh, again, in terms of IFR skills, right, we know he was undergoing instrument training, but not fully competent yet, right? CFIs even said, not good to take a check ride yet. Now, with the self-assessment, I am safe. Well, pretty much every item here he hit. Um, so illness, right off the bat, we talked about that foot injury, right? He literally just got off the cast uh, the day before. He's still limping, and an instructor had to help him land the airplane a few weeks prior and even taxi it. Uh, medication, nothing explicitly stated, but maybe he was taking something with some side effects. We don't know. Uh, stress, pretty, pretty evident here, right, with those marital and financial troubles. Alcohol. Um, we know that again the night before he went out and had some drinks, but we don't know if that has anything to do with the accident or played a role. Fatigue, again, possibly, right? Didn't sleep much the night before. That can definitely skew our decision making. And then in terms of eating, we don't know, but emotion, right? Likely not in the highest of spirits because of that stress. So that's pretty much every uh, hazard possible in I am safe and pilot. A lot just from looking at that. Now going to the uh, A aircraft good amount of things here too so the biggest one would probably be a uh, familiarity with aircraft systems and equipment now okay we, we know that he just got endorsed for the complex two months ago the airplane is relatively new but um you know he, he did receive a good amount of instruction and in it, it looks like and instructors even stated he was competent flying the airplane and using the autopilot that was installed which leads to the next category of the equipment on board, right? Um, so he had an autopilot and a, a KLN 90B GPS moving map, right? And they were actually connected. So you just fly the Magenta line using the autopilot and they were in working condition, but for some reason he wasn't using them. Uh, we don't know anything about the rest of the stuff like the runway lengths, weight and balance, fuel and inspection. We assume that was okay, but those first two items, definitely some hazards to think about in terms of aircraft. 
environment. Well, there's a lot of them here. Um, as true, I brought up before the weather is one, one of the biggest, right? We, we talked about before you got to get a weather briefing and he literally did not do that one important thing here. Um, you know, back then what, what you had to do, you call the briefer, you get your briefing. No, no weather briefing, no record of that conducted here. Again, he did look at a couple items like those METARs. Um, they did show VFR, even though there's haze and low visibility. So again, legally, yeah, you're, you're, you're VFR, but that's not ideal for you to go flying at nighttime, especially as a non-instrument rated private pilot. Uh, next, airports. We assume that was okay. And again, he seems to be pretty familiar with the route as he's flown it a bunch of times in the last 15 months. Uh, airspace, right? Yeah, there was some controlled airspace that he had to deal with. Didn't seem like that presented any problems. No special use airspace. Uh, but what did present a problem, and we're going to talk about this as one of the main themes of this accident. He chose to fly over a large featureless body of water at nighttime. When you have that and you have low visibility, this can often cause a loss of visual reference to the horizon. What does that mean? Well, you're flying IFR, just like Sri Ram said before, and that's not good. We just said he's a private pilot, but doesn't have an instrument rating. Yes, we know he's training for it, but his instructors literally said, you're not good enough yet for it. Um, continuing on terrain, right? Same, same message. There's didn't seem to be any obstacles or anything, but again, he's, he's flying over a 30 mile open stretch of water and nothing around him. And we know that the weather's not good. Not good. All right. And last thing here, day versus nighttime. We've already just discussed a bunch of times flying over water at nighttime and losing the horizon, but another hazard, um, would be limited emergency landing sites. You're at nighttime, you're over water. All you got is water below you. You know, that's not, not good. You don't want to be de dealing with that. And the most important here, and uh, we saw a bunch of them, external pressures. This is the stuff that will mess you up. Number one, this flight has a purpose. He needs to get uh, to this uh, wedding. Well, first of all, he has to drop off his uh, sister-in-law and then fly somewhere else to make it in time for a family member wedding, right? That's obvious get there itis. Family knows, they, they expect you to be there. They're looking forward to seeing you. They're expecting you to make a toast, whatever it is. You're already departing late, right? He um, planned to depart at six, departed two and a half hours late. He's JFK Jr. His, his last name is Kennedy. So all of that by itself are some pretty big external pressures that can really, really, really skew your decision making. And that, that's the important stuff to remember. We All the other stuff is, yes, important. But it's this stuff that'll cause you to forget everything else and make a decision based on those external pressures. So a lot. So, okay, that was the first step of the three Ps. We just perceived tons of hazards. So now we're going to evaluate the level, level of risk associated with those hazards using the CARE acronym. So first off, what are the consequences? Well, there is a lot here. Um, we talked about how that weather and flying over water at night is not good, right? You can get into IFR conditions. And especially if you're not instrument rated, you can easily become spatially disoriented which is what happened in this case. And overall, his lack of experience in the airplane at night combined with the poor weather, the physical limitations, right? The stress and all those external pressures and factors can easily lead to an accident, just like we said. And probably what was on his mind is, oh my God, I'm going to miss this wedding, right? My family's not going to be happy with me. I don't know what they're going to do afterwards. Not good. That's, that's probably what's on his mind rather than an accident, right? And again, that's the external pressures. Those are the things that will really mess everything up. Okay, so now alternatives. Well, what else could we do? Well, in the background, we talked about how a CFI, his CFI, offered to go fly with him during the trip. He could have just said yes, put the pride aside and said yes, why don't you fly with me? And likely the accident wouldn't have occurred. Um, second option, you know, maybe there's another airplane to fly that he's more familiar with. I, I don't know if he was still familiar with the 182 or anything like that, but that could be something. Uh, next, alter the flight plan to minimize flight over water. Yeah, you know, that's going to add on some distance and time, but safety is more important, right? Uh, again, we, we talked about how, I'll show you guys the uh, sky vector again. From right here, Point Judith. All the way to Martha's Vineyard was like a 30 to 40 mile stretch of open water. Um, he could have just tucked a coast like this, go over the land. Yeah, it's going to add some time and distance, but negligible and a lot more important. He'd probably still be alive today. 
or the alternative that is uh, always there for everybody, cancel the flight. There's always another day. There is always another day to go fly, right? We put a cancel flight, maybe drive instead or whatever it is. Yes, be late, but you'd be alive, right? So those are the alternatives in this case. Next, you would have to take a look at the reality of the situation, right? So yes, it's important to accept the reality that, you know, limited experience can create a lot of additional risks, right? It can lead to task saturation, not good. Um, and again, we repeated this a bunch of times, but hazy conditions, Flying at night over large open body of water is not good for a non-instrument rated private pilot. And yes, even though you got training, that can easily get you disoriented, which is what happened here. And again, those external pressures that affect our thinking are pretty clear here. They get their itis right because this flight had a mission he needed to get to that wedding. Didn't want to disappoint his uh, wife and sister-in-law on board the airplane. Didn't want to disappoint his family, right? They're all expecting him to be there in pride, right? He he said he wanted to do the flight alone without a CFI, right? That's So he felt he had the skill to do it. Um, and even connected to that would be complacency, possibly. He's probably thinking, yeah, I've done this flight so many times. It should be okay. It's probably okay. But there's that word again, probably, right? If you're ever saying it'll probably be okay, that's where you need to sit down and kind of take a good look at what's going on, and maybe reevaluate your decisions. Now, the last step, of course, would be uh, performing the risk management. So we got four options here. You can transfer the risk. You could, again, have that CFI fly and the CFI would act as PIC, everything would have been okay. Could have eliminated the risk by just totally canning the trip, maybe driving instead. Uh, accepting the risk. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'd say based on our uh, analysis of everything, there's way too many risks to accept in this case. I wouldn't do that. Uh, but mitigating the risk, definitely some options here, right? Um, engage in more careful pre-flight planning with checking the weather and, and maybe following the flight plan. Here's something else that I didn't mention before, but uh, he chose not to get flight following uh, during this flight. And I don't really know why always get it if it's available. There's no reason not to. And we'll talk about that later as well, but uh, he could have gotten flight following, right? They could have provided help in an emergency situation. Um, and also just something as simple as managing family expectations and making alternative arrangements, telling them, hey, it may not actually be there tonight. Hey, uh, something as simple as that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, what is flight following? Yeah, flight following is essentially a service that's provided um, by air traffic controllers, certain air traffic controllers to VFR pilots, um, including like traffic advisories or help in an emergency situation. Uh, they can only provide it, though, on a workload permitting basis. So if they're too busy dealing with other airplanes, they can't they can say no, but usually they will provide it to us. It's an extra set of eyes, essentially, right? Another tool that maybe you have an engine problem, you need to divert right away. Just ask them. They'll tell you what the nearest airport is rather than you trying to figure it out on your own, right? Or pointing out traffic or helping with weather, telling you all that stuff. So yeah, it's just uh, another set of eyes and, and more safety whenever you're getting flight following. So yeah, if it's, it's available, you like, would never turn it down. It's, it's the same thing like uh, the radio is saying, hey, student pilot. So oh yeah okay yeah so if you guys are you know student pilots in training and you're totally you're not super comfortable with your radio calls you can yeah you can definitely say student pilot and um they'll probably help you out a little bit more but yeah that that can definitely play a part of it as well totally right excellent well it's pretty clear here that uh that's some pretty poor decision making and that decision making caused him to press on even after getting in the air and seeing how bad it was remember this is a continuous process yes he could have ignored all that gotten in the air and says huh it's pretty dark and i don't see the horizon let me turn around and, and still didn't do that so just remember you're always going to get a new set of circumstances keep doing this 3p thing over and over again all right okay so Last thing here, we're just going to go over some takeaways, hopefully from this accident, you guys can probably think of all of them by now. Um, and they're pretty straightforward and, and hopefully all of us instructors are preaching these things already. Uh, but number one thing, always conduct a thorough pre-flight weather briefing to identify any weather related hazards, right? Got to do it. You legally got to do it. Use the I am safe checklist to assess your physical and mental readiness before flying, right? I get this. All this stuff can seem silly, but it's important. It's here for a reason, right? You don't want to be flying if you've been drinking, you're, you're not feeling well, you're sleepy, all that kind of stuff. 
Remember that external pressures such as get there itis in this scenario, right, are the one risk factor category that can cause you to ignore everything else. I know I've said that like 10 times already, but it's it's that important. Um, that get there itis is is real and it'll mess everything up, cause you to forget all those other important uh, um, hazards and just kind of focus on that. And again, it's a continuous loop process. Always engage in continuous ADM so that you can readily adapt to any sudden changes in flight and make good decisions, right? There's never a need to press on or keep going, right? That's where that planned continuation bias comes in. Don't be afraid to get additional training from a CFI on areas that you don't have much time in or are lacking experience in. Um, for example, I've had a lot of students recently pass their check ride and they kind of come back and say, hey, um, Let's get some additional training in class B, or I want to do some more landings and flying at nighttime, for example. And that's, that's good. You know, you don't want to be taking on those risks by yourself. And in this situation, he could have just said yes to the CFI flying with him, right? Uh, just like we were talking about before, always get flight following if it's available, right? They're not just traffic advisories. They're also there to help in emergency situations. And they could have, again, potentially helped in this case too. Night flying, right? Remember that night flying does carry some additional risks to be aware of. And the main lesson from here was that featureless horizon, right? Yeah, low visibility can blend with the water and kind of loss and, and, and make your horizon all obscured and cause you to get disoriented. Now, if you do get into that situation, if you ever encounter a VFR into IMC, what we call it situation, what you want to do is execute a standard rate 180 degree turn by reference to your instruments, right? And you're going to be trained to do that during your private pod training, right? And the last thing here, very important as well, uh, use a personal minimums checklist for easier go or no go decisions. And we'll talk about that soon. When you're making these minimums for yourself, just remember to be more conservative for night flight just because we know it has some additional uh, risks. And last thing here. So how can we actually apply all this stuff since some of it seems a little weird? So this is directly taken from the P hack. It says, your mental willingness to follow through on safe decisions, especially those that require delay or diversion is critical. You can bulk up your mental muscles by, and we have a couple of things, but um, that part I have bolded is really important. You know, you, you can't just sit there and, and realize, yeah, there's a cloud in front of me and just think for two minutes, what am I going to do? You got to make a decision. And for some people, it's not easy to do that right away. Right. Um, so how do we kind of fix that? Well, we just talked about personal minimums, right? This is really good, at, especially if, at least for making decisions on the ground um, to go or not go on it. And I have one linked here that I will open. This is um, personal minimum checklist from the FAA or King of Schools actually. And look at this. It's divided into PAVE, which is why we just talked about this. All the hazards right here. So maybe you want to have a certain amount of takeoff and landings in the last 30 days or a certain amount of sleep, max amount of crosswind component or ceilings for day and night. All, all this kind of stuff is good for you to sit down with your instructor uh, before, even after you get your license to think about it so you can make easier uh, decisions. Always have alternatives. In other words, keep thinking ahead, right? You know, planning for alternative airports um, beforehand and along the route, right? Yeah, cruising is fun. You don't do anything. You just sit there, look out the window, but think, what am I going to do if I have an engine failure? Is, is How's the weather looking here? All that kind of stuff. You want to stay ahead of the airplane and keep thinking. Um, this one seems kind of odd, but you can even brief your passengers beforehand by preparing them for maybe like a delay or diversion. And essentially, you're involving them in your evaluation process. You're not letting them make the decision, but you're involving them in your process because they can definitely be a source of an external pressure, right? And finally, one of the most important, something I do all the time and recommend people to do, uh, post-flight analysis, right? Uh, flying is fun, and but it's not always perfect, right? After your, after your flight is done, you can always review, go back and review, uh, analyze and learn from any mistakes or judgment errors that you made, right? You know, and that's where you can really relearn. And then for next time, say, okay, let me try to fix those things beforehand, right? But uh, that's all I got for you guys. Sorry, I kind of ran uh, a little bit over eight o'clock, but that's uh, risk management using the 3P uh, process. So we'll open it up for additional questions here. I have a couple of messages. I'll read those as well. Um, Sriram asked, 
Uh, I'm a new student pilot and I'm amazed with what Forefly can offer. Yeah, it's awesome. Can you point me to some absolutely necessary material to start with? Or if you don't have one, maybe an opportunity for a future webinar session. So uh, good news is a couple months ago, I did do a webinar on the uh, fundamentals of Forefly and it is on the Princeton Flying School YouTube channel. So you can definitely check that out. If you don't like hearing me talk, there's also uh, other webinars out there on YouTube that are good to get started. And that's what I use. I think Four Flight itself made one too. So I used that when I was getting familiar with it. But yeah, there's a lot. It's all very helpful, but it's a lot to absorb. You don't want to be learning it while you're flying the airplane, of course. So you want to sit down on the ground. What I'll usually do with my students, um, you know, when we get to that cross country planning stage and after we learn it on paper, we'll also sit down on the ground and learn how to use Four Flight and how we can actually uh, kind of apply it to the airplane. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, next thing, I was reading about a spin accident in Florida. Can you do a case analysis on this? Yeah, let me take a look at. Uh, um, use the second link, okay? Not the first, not the first. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, my personal feeling it was the ATC, which was the problem, but what could have the pilot done to mitigate the situation? Okay. Let me open it up. See if I know what this is about. All right, I see that this is the Air Safety Institute um, channel, which is great. Oh, this is the one with the uh, controller, right? And he's like on base to final and yeah. I think, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the, I may not remember all the key details of this one, right? But I think uh, one of the things was kind of at the last second, the controller was almost yelling at the pilot to tighten up the turn or make the, or something. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, so this is a lesson on remembering that you, the pilot, are PIC, and you have the final say to everything, all the operation of the airplane. You never want to let the uh, controller, in this case, right, make the uh, decision for you. There's definitely other stuff as well. Um, I'll take a look at that. But uh, yeah, it's a good example of a case study. But if you guys don't know that channel, Air Safety Institute, definitely check it out. Um, Gilbert asked, are the Princeton Flight School videos linked to the web page or are they randomly available on YouTube? What search should I use? Um, they are on the Princeton Flying School website, which I'll link in the chat. And additionally, um, they're all, well, I should say, they're first of all, they're published on the Princeton Flying School uh, YouTube channel. So let me link that first. You guys can see everything. Okay, so that's the Princeton Flying School channel. You'll find all the webinars we've done in the past. Um, and then if you guys want to look directly on the Flying School website, there it is. I'm not sure if it's in each of the descriptions, but you guys can also access all of the PowerPoints and materials um, that I use in here as well. So. As a matter of fact, I'll just send a, the Google Drive link to the folder now in the chat, and it should also be in the description to the webinars, but that folder has every uh, presentation that we've done in, in addition to any supplementary materials, which actually reminds me, I need to show you guys this. Um, here's the document that has all the stuff we just talked about, the three Ps into just three concise pages. So, you know, the three steps, right, and the acronyms and all the, the sub-components uh, to them. So that will be found in the google drive folder as well all right any uh any other questions any suggestions of future topics or uh, anything else i got a question yeah what's up like uh what if you take like what if the conditions are perfectly fine you take off via far and then like you you take off to see the sunset and then let's say the clouds like start coming in like, let's say you mm -hmm. go up for like an hour cruise and then the clouds start to block out the visual to the mm -hmm. ground. What would you do in that case? How would you get back down to the airport while, while still maintaining VFR conditions? Okay. So, um, well, it would honestly depend on the situation. You could obviously turn around if the weather's okay. Uh, maybe if there's an airport nearby that the ceilings are... Uh, VFR in this situation, you can divert to that as well. ATC you can also help you provide weather if if you can't do that yourself. Um, but yeah, it would depend on the, the exact situation. I don't know if I'm answering the question completely, but all right, makes sense. Awesome. 
Thank you, Alan. Glad to see you in here. All right, any, uh, any other questions? Doesn't have to be totally related to this as well. If you guys uh, have any future topic suggestions, we'll do that as well. But sorry, we're running over time, but thanks, guys. All right, well, I guess that's it. But yeah, if you guys have uh, any other suggestions for topics, definitely let us know. You can email the airport. I think it's 39n at princetonairport.com, probably, or, or just Talk to Steve and Gab or anybody else there, and we'll uh, we'll make it happen. Um, hopefully, this was uh, enjoyable for you guys, and you'll learn something. I know it's a little bit of an odd topic, um, but definitely important as it's often brushed over during your training. But uh, thank you guys for spending an hour and twenty minutes with us tonight. Yeah, you're right, right about nice. that, AJ. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Wes. Of night, course, guys. guys. Have a great night. Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. It was very interesting. Good. I'm glad to hear. I was, I was kind of worried it'd be a little boring. No, but, it was uh, very good. <laughs> One awesome, thing, awesome. Uh, it actually correlates to something completely different. I recently got a training um, in sales for technical people. Okay. I thought, it's, I thought it's a crazy thing, but one sentence that actually stuck was um, we decide emotionally and justify rationally after yeah decide. that is uh that is perfect for what we just talked about today that's that, perfect that yeah that's this entire presentation summed up into well, i don't know how many words that was yeah you're exactly right about that <laughs> totally could right that? pardon could you, could you repeat just that i just missed what you just said uh we what? decide emotionally Okay. And justify rationally afterwards. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that down. So whatever you the, decide, you find you will find reasons why this decision is right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know you're exactly right. I know we just sat down here and analyzed all this stuff, but yeah, it's those external pressures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emotions and affect our decision making totally right but, but, uh, you know i just want to add a point there yeah hindsight is 50 50. you can always analyze behind the fact right? on the given time is a different different situation right right, right. yeah so yeah so whatever it, whatever it means <laughs> yeah no you're, you're totally right we, we can sit here and, and uh, analyze this stuff uh for hours but yeah when you're in, in this situation it uh it can really those external factors can really, really skew the decision making. So yep, yep. it's just important to be aware of them. That that's that's really it. And then practicing these kind of situations with an instructor is important as well. Yeah. Fair point. I agree. Have a good night, guys. All yeah. Right. Thank you so thank much you. for spending uh, some time with us tonight, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. All right. Thank have you. a good night. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, have of a good course. night. Good thank night. you very much. You, you got good. it. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't hit the button. <laughs> All right. I think I don't know if Gab is here or is it Jack now? Let's see. What do we have? Which which near That's bird? Okay. It's Jack. What's up? All right. We are uh all done. Excellent. Dude, that was How's super interesting. That was a great one. Glad to hear. Uh, yeah, I was, I was honestly worried this would be super boring. Is I mean, it's a risk man. This is really good. It's really fun and interesting. <laughs> good. I, the um the JFK story got us a little disappointed. We were like, wow, he's just he was an idiot. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was reading. I was reading this. I'm like, oh my god, dude, it's terrible. Everything is messing up. Yeah. 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 Especially like the CF5. <laughs> yeah, I know. How are you gonna say no to that? Bro, yeah. It's so not even like money's a problem too. for him too, man. He's JFK Jr. So it's like, come on. Yeah. yeah. Really That's right. But yeah, dude. Well done. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we will see you. We'll be here, uh, here this weekend. All right. Have a good night, guys. Uh, have a good night. Thank see you. Ya.
You got it.